So one of the biggest things that uh, has come along in the last couple years is home automation. A um, few years before that, it was a rather expensive kind of hobby to get into, and it was very um, tightly coupled with the manufacture of the hardware and what you could do with it. Uh, so with the invention of some of the microcomputers, Pines, uh, Raspberry Pis, any number of other ones, you can create any kind of sensors you want yourself as well as tie into a number of different platforms. So out there, there are different platforms that range from the Wink Home Automation Hub, Vera, Iris, Insteon, all these different hubs that have different devices that work with them. And those devices stem from things as simple as light switches, uh, smart outlets, smart power strips, uh, AC units, garage doors, door locks, you name it, it's pretty much been connected anymore. And even to that fact that um, GE is getting ready to come out with a washing machine and a dryer that's connected so you can actually know the status of that device before and during its run cycles. So the problem is, is that once you invest in one of these platforms, you're kind of tied to it. There's really no way to get away with, it, with moving to somewhere else unless you want to buy all new hardware. So for example, at home I'm heavily invested in Wink, but there's some sensors that Wink doesn't support. So I needed a way to be able to kind of tie all these systems together. So there's an open source project called Home Assistant. And Home Assistant is a Python 3 based open source application that allows you to tie all these different types of systems, hubs, and devices together. Um, anything you can think of, you can create it. So one of the things with this Home Assistant is it didn't support garage doors uh, about two months ago. I wanted my garage door to be able to control it. So I wrote the module that supports garage door support. So any LiftMaster or Chamberlain garage door that has the internet gateway can be controlled by it. So instead of just talking about it, let's just show it to you. So I have here a essentially a control panel that I'm starting to build uh, for my house. It's not quite finished. It's not as I like to call it, beautified by my wife who needs to paint it and whatnot still before it gets mounted on the wall. Hence the uh, fancy scroll work on the, on the woodwork. So essentially what we have here is a Raspberry Pi, uh, mind you a Raspberry Pi 3, so the latest one to come out, running the Raspberry Pi 7 inch touchscreen. So we can actually walk up and touch it and interact with this web interface. Now this web interface is ex accessible anywhere that you allow it to be. So in this case, the Raspberry Pi starts up its OS and then it launches Chromium in kiosk mode and it loads this uh, website. This website allows you to interact with all the different components that you've assigned to your profile or your home assistant uh, configuration. Um, one of the things that I decided to just add was the Raspberry Pi. And as you can see, it does take snapshots and updates the main page roughly every five seconds, and that again is a configurable value. So in here, I've tied this into some of the stuff that's at my house right now. So if I were to, for example, we can see that the lock um, right here is currently locked, and the garage door is currently closed. So if I were to flip the lock switch, which obviously I'm not going to do, that would unlock my front door. <laughs> Don't really want to do that from here. We can tie in the Nest thermostat that I have. So currently it's 70 degrees, it's set for 71. Um, we can change the mode of the thermostat, change its target temperature, everything right from here. So that's all fine and dandy for controlling each individual thing, but Home Assistant takes it one step farther. And what it really lets you do is tie everything together and you can create different automation robots and schemes. So I have them disabled for now because the device is not at home. Um, basically, one of the scenes that I have and that I'm currently working on is that, pardon? Yes, no? Okay. Um, is I have a sleep number bed at home. Now, a, with the sleep number bed, they have a functionality called Sleep IQ. And that basically tells you information about how you're sleeping. And one of the side effects of that is they have a web API that can actually determine if you're in bed or not. So I'm working on a module right now to actually integrate sleep numbers, sleep IQ, 
API into Home Assistant. And then from that, I can basically determine if both of us, me and my wife are laying in bed and it's after 10 o'clock, close the garage doors, lock the front doors, turn off the lights in the living room and everything else in the house. So we can kind of lock that down just based on that. You can set up scenes. So let's say one of the functionalities of Home Assist is that you can tie in media players and or smart TVs. So it supports Samsung, LG, smart TVs. It'll support different uh, uh, media receivers such as um, Denon receivers. And it actually will allow you to control those devices from the web interface. So you could create a scene, for example, watch a movie. And in your living room, th they have support for motorized blinds. We can drop those blinds down, we can turn down the lights, we can then turn on the TV, we can change it to the right inputs, we can do everything with a single click through the home automation. And it's completely configurable to whatever you want to do. And that's one of the great things about it. Another thing about this is that not only is it just kind of what you have, you can set up groups and different collections of like devices. So in this this example, I have the great room, I have a master bedroom, I have outdoor lights, office, guest room, kitchen, garage lights. So the kitchen lights, it'll tell you whether they're available or unavailable. So kitchen lights themselves, in this case, these are recessed lights, and they actually are turned on and off by a switch. And the reason for that is because they're temperature controlled. So we can actually change the, essentially, the, the temperature value going from a warm yellow light to a bright white light depending on the time of day. Um, and so they don't necessarily show up as being on or off because they're turned off at the switch. Um, another thing is we can use status. So in this case, speedtest.net. It's a simple module that you can have that'll automatically run and it'll run speed tests from the device and it'll keep a history of it. So you can actually track if you're getting services that you're supposed to get and different things like that over time. You can also use this, again, in other automation rules. So if you want to say when your internet speed is low because something's going on, send you a notification. Or if your internet speed's not working, send you a notification. You can tie home automation and home assistant into notifications as well. So another thing that this software really allows you to do is it lets you create zones or uh, specific areas. So based on that, it can use um, some other technologies, some mosquito uh, MQTT uh, small notifications to talk back and forth uh, from a de remote device to the main server. And in this case, for example, my iPhone using the iCloud uh, plugin because iCloud has Find My Phone, it actually knows whether I'm here or at home. And you can create a zone based on that. And I don't have any setup on this specific instance. But I could create a work zone and a home zone. So when I get home, it can go ahead and turn the light on, lower the temperature, open the garage door as it connects to the network or gets in that geofenced area. And again, all of this is configurable. One of the nice things that I like about this is that it has logbooks. So anything that you are connected to, it can actually track. It also has a history. So you can go back. I may not have any history for uh, yesterday. But you can go through and see your weather summary, so it's partly cloudy until a certain time, and then light rain, or you can see whether the sun was up, or the lights were on or off, um, and different things like that. Um, so one of the other automations that I have at home is I have door sensors, essentially trippers on all the major access points to the house. So for example, on the back door, because we have a dog, if you open the back door and it's after sunset, turn on the backyard lights so that we can see what's going on. That way we don't have to worry about dealing with that. Those lights then will go back off based on the motion sensor automatically. So basically if no, nothing's detected after five minutes, then turn it off. But one of the real nice things about this is that if we go to Home Assistant's website, they list out all the components you could possibly want to use. So they have support for an obscene number of devices, and that extends from 
the Amazon Echo all the way down to Arduino. Um, you can make your own switches using Raspberry Pis. If, if you can build it, you can support it in this. And that's one of the great things about Home Assistant in terms of that home automation sense. You're not tied into a specific platform. You're not tied to the constraints of what that platform can do. You can really extend and do whatever you want. Uh, one, of the, one of the other great things about this is that it is remote accessible. So anywhere in the world I can be notified if something happens at home. I can turn lights on. Let's say I go out and the dog's at home and I forget to leave the light on and it's 10 o'clock at night. I can turn the light on for the dog. So overall, it's really, it's kind of amazing what the infrastructure can do from that sense of open source. And the fact that you can contribute back to it means that you can add anything you want to it. So again, you're not tied to those specific constraints of an individual platform, but yet you get the power of all the platforms. And that's kind of the basic of home automation from the sense of tying multiple different systems together. Anybody have any questions? Yes? What was your like, overall and total investment to make all of that happen? Like, how, how much did you spend out of pocket? So the Wink Hub, that's it's a funny thing. So every one of the different home automations, they go on sale constantly at Lowe's, Home Depot, online. I think with all of the sales, I. I've never paid full price for a light bulb. They've always been 50% or more off. And I think I have about 15 light bulbs in the house right now with about 15 more that are still in boxes. With the hub and the various other things, maybe $500 and that's it. And then I'm working on right now adding the support for um, Apple TV using their home sharing as well as the sleep IQ so that you can control Apple TV through this as well. Yes? What are you using for the lights? Is that Hue or is it, or do you use other stuff? Um, so right now I have primarily GE link bulbs, which are specifically just brightness. The recess lights I bought were the um, commercial electric that do temperature changing, but the platform does support Hue and can handle all the different color changes and everything else. So you haven't gone in and, re and, and rewired any um, no, because every, everything that I've added has either been controlled by the hub to the bulb itself. Um, there are support for, obviously, switches that are in the wall. I have, I have some outlets, I just haven't changed them out yet. Yes? This isn't really specific to Home Assistant, but uh, just kind of the whole thing in general. Mm -hmm. what, what are the concerns about security? Because having my front door hooked up to the internet is kind of terrifying. <laughs> So that's one of the, the beautiful things about this is when you set it up, you can actually set up passcodes for everything. So the front doors by default that you actually have to have a passcode to unlock them. That same passcode is required in order to unlock them. So it's, I would essentially say, yes, you theoretically could brute force it into it, but that depends again on how long the passcode is uh, for the lock. Okay. Um, but all of this, my remote access to this actually requires a VPN into my house okay. in order to access it. So you, actually, you need to be able to log into the VPN before you can even get to this. And this has a login at my house. I just happened to hook up some of the stuff for this just so I could access it outside. Because I'm hitting a lot of the stuff you can't see because it's all internal to the house. But specifically, what's on here right now is all the products that are Wink based because you can access Wink's hub through third party AP, or through their APIs and then the camera that's mounted to the Raspberry Pi. Okay. 